you mind, I'm just in a bit of a hurry, just moving your car a little. Whatever, buddy. Go to hell. told to go to hell. I've heard someone sing about a bat out of hell and we say there will be hell to pay and we make people's lives hell. But I never realised it was a real place. You see, most people think that hell is down there, but according to my GPS, it's just up the road. Going to hell. Please follow the highlighted road. thought it would be starting to warm up a bit by now. This is the Museum of the Souls of Purgatory in Rome. The artefacts in this museum have been collected from all over Europe and are exhibited to motivate visitors to pray for those souls stuck in purgatory. So the story goes, purgatory is kind of like a halfway house between heaven and hell. I don't know if you've noticed, but everything in this museum is singed or burned around the edges. Purgatory is not really your ideal end-of-year holiday destination. And they tell me that hell's a lot worse. Hello, welcome to hell. Thank you. And how are you today? Well, thank you. Good. Indeed. Good. Yes, this is hell, huh? Are you visiting us today? I am. And where are you from? Australia. Australia? A long way away. I'll say. What the hell took you so long? <laughs> I'm wondering that myself. Well, you come on in and make yourself Could a Could I home. just have a look around? Go right ahead. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you let us know. Thank okay? you. Just how this town, not too far from Detroit, Michigan, came by its name is a matter of local legend. But one thing is certain, it hasn't hurt them. Every year, hell hosts the I ran through hell foot race, the cruise to hell and back for classic car collectors, and local weather crews watch the spillway behind me to see if this will be the year hell finally freezes over. It's all a bit of fun, really. But the town even hosted a party on the 6th of the 6th, 2006, selling souvenirs for, you guessed it, $6 and 66 cents. I think I'll take this one.
Father Mario, you have this painting, fresco, depicting purgatory. How does this painting explain purgatory? Dunque, questa pala d'altare, come si chiamano queste pitture, è una delle, delle più grandi che ci sono qui a Roma. Ed è una pala simile a quelle del 300, del tempo cioè di, eh, di Giotto, di Cimabue, che ha una finalità didattica, catechetica, cioè vuole insegnare un qualche cosa che eh, noi esprimiamo, diciamo, in termini teologici, cioè il dogma del purgatorio. Come possiamo vedere, al centro c'è Gesù, infinita misericordia, il Sacro Cuore, che ama gli uomini ed è pieno di misericordia. Poi alla sua destra c'è la Madonna e alla sua sinistra San Giuseppe, che intercedono per le anime del Purgatorio. Perché il dogma del Purgatorio dice questo, che eh, quando noi andremo davanti a Dio, purtroppo non saremo completamente puri e pieni di luce, avremo bisogno di un periodo, diciamo così, di decontaminazione delle miserie nostre umane. Allora, il Purgatorio serve per questo. Ma il Purgatorio non è un luogo di punizione, è un luogo, è l'anticamera del Paradiso. Quindi allora, con l'aiuto della preghiera degli altri, l'intercessione dei Santi, specialmente l'offerta della Santa Messa, i, eh, diciamo così, coloro che sono nel Purgatorio si purificano e poi vanno in Paradiso. E qui è rappresentata da una parte il Purgatorio, come lo possiamo rappresentare noi con, diciamo così, con segni che ci fanno pensare quasi al fuoco. Poi c'è l'offerta della Messa, che la offre sì il sacerdote, ma è Gesù Cristo che si offre nella Messa, l'angelo che porta l'offerta in cielo, e poi l'angelo che passa nel Purgatorio a portare via le anime purificate, le porta in Paradiso vede l'altro angelo su che le porta in paradiso. E questo, se, questo modo di, di procedere serve per far comprendere eh, alle menti meno elevate eh, una dottrina, un, un, un dogma di fede che non è tanto facile da, da potersi capire in 4 e 4 8. Ecco, I dogmi non sono facili da capire nessuno, sono tutti eh, che rassentano appunto il mistero e quindi noi le accettiamo perché ce le rivela Gesù Cristo attraverso la Chiesa. So tell me a bit about the founder of this church, Victor Giuet. Allora, padre Giuet è un missionario del Sacro Cuore francese. Il padre Giuet è stato sempre un, una persona che ha avuto una grande venerazione per le anime del Purgatorio. Questo spiega perché lui ha intrapreso un viaggio per tutta l'Europa a raccogliere questa do documentazione che adesso vedremo. E ecco perché anche nel, nel modo di parlare della gente qui di Roma, questa chiesa di per sé si chiama Sacro Cuore in Prati, per distinguerla dal Sacro Cuore in, eh, che sta vicino alla stazione Termini fatta dal, da San Giovanni Bosco dunque eh, Sacro Cuore in Prate però la gente l'ha chiamata sempre Sacro Cuore del Suffragio perché Padre Giuetta ha avuto sempre questa devozione per le anime sante del Purgatorio e perché ha sempre fatto celebrare messe in suffragio delle anime del Purgatorio ecco perché Suffragio Sacro Cuore del Suffragio il nome ufficiale è Sacro Cuore in Prati di Castello up here. Do you know the average person throws out about a ton of garbage every year? That's a lot of waste, but as bad as it smells, you can find some really interesting things at the rubbish dump. Everything here has a story. And everything had a life outside of this, its final resting place. Now, for whatever reason, it's all just waste, piled up here to rot.
the word hell is so full of imagery, meaning, and emotion that any town named hell is going to get our attention. Yet for many people, whether they believe it's real or not, the concept of purgatory and hell conjures up images of torment and torture, a place where people burn for eternity as a punishment for their wrong deeds. The logic's quite simple. God claims he's loving, hell says he's not. Now, I've had some enemies in my time and everlasting suffering is not a fate I'd wish on even the worst one. I don't think you would either. So, here's the deal. Either you and I are more loving than God and he's vindictive, sadistic and cruel, or somehow we've got our wires crossed. God actually is love and an everlasting torture in an ever-burning hell doesn't exist. And yet the Bible does talk about hell. So what and where is it? Jesus saw something similar to this place in his day. Outside the city of Jerusalem, there was a valley known to the locals as Gehenna. For generations, it had been a dumping ground. The whole area was constantly smouldering, consuming Jerusalem's rubbish. To the inhabitants of Jerusalem, it appeared that the site burned forever. So it's no wonder that when Jesus spoke of hell, he often used the word Gehenna. It instantly evoked a picture in the minds of those listening to him speak. Whether it was a worn out pair of sandals or the bodies of those too poor to afford their own burial, the rubbish dump at Gehenna was where they ended up. Gehenna was synonymous with rejection and destruction. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have everlasting life. What are the two ultimate fates presented here? There are only two. One is the promise of everlasting life. The other is to simply perish. There's no mention here of burning forever in pain and torment, just life or death. We make our choice and the consequences are forever, either eternal life or eternal disconnect from the giver of life. But the devil would have you believe that you're like this doll, loved for a while by God and then discarded. It's just the picture he would paint. It plays right into the lie that God's holding you back, trying to catch you out so he can punish your sins forever. You know, teach you a lesson you won't soon forget. But the Bible paints a very different picture, one where God's desperately holding out his hand to offer us salvation, and we ultimately accept it or reject it. It's our choice. I'm really interested in knowing how people end up in purgatory and how we can help them out. Allora, eh, quando è che si è destinati al purgatorio? Di per sé si è destinati al purgatorio nel momento della nostra morte, perché dipende da come noi moriamo. Se moriamo nel pieno amore di Dio, nella grazia di Dio, andiamo in paradiso. Se abbiamo qualche colpa da scontare, andiamo in purgatorio. Se invece siamo nel peccato grave, in piena avvertenza e deliberata consenza, allora purtroppo andiamo all'inferno. Dunque, il nostro grande poeta Petrarca diceva sempre «Ho paura di questo momento, cioè del momento della morte». Il dubbioso Calle lo chiamava. Perché? E perché da lì dipende tutta la nostra esistenza dopo la morte. Quindi se siamo nel peccato, se siamo, anche se ci siamo pentiti dei nostri peccati, però le nostre colpe ce le portiamo sempre appresso, andremo un po' a purificarci nel purgatorio. Poi quando la bontà di Dio riterrà che siamo sufficientemente purificati, allora andremo nella gloria, nella luce del paradiso. Dunque, chi, chi, chi ci destina lì? È Dio stesso, nella sua infinita giustizia, che ci dice di fare un pochettino di anticamera, per intenderci. Ecco, l'anticamera è il purgatorio.
perché gli altri possono meritare e chi sta nel purgatorio non può meritare per se stesso? Perché con la morte si chiude la possibilità di meritare o di non meritare. Finché siamo in vita possiamo fare il bene e il male. Dopo la morte non possiamo fare più nulla, né il bene né il male. Quello che è fatto è fatto, è chiuso. Però se gli altri ci vogliono bene, sono legati a noi e dal vincolo della carità di Gesù Cristo e da altri vincoli di amore. Per esempio un papà e una mamma vogliono bene al loro figlio e il figlio dovrà, penso, che voglia bene al suo papà. Ecco perché gli si dice di far celebrare delle messe per il proprio papà e la propria mamma, di fare delle opere buone in suffragio dei propri genitori. Ecco perché il bene che fa il figlio per il proprio genitore acquista un merito e Dio ne tiene conto. Invece loro che stanno in purgatorio per se stessi non possono meritare. Però una buona parola per noi che siamo ancora qui sulla terra a combattere, ce la possono mettere, possono pregare per noi, non per se stessi, ma per noi sì. Ecco, questa è, il, è la dottrina della Chiesa su questo argomento. If hell ever needed another name, then surely it would be this place. If you found yourself standing on the platform at Dachau, near Munich, you knew you were in for a lot of trouble. Dachau was the first of Adolf Hitler's concentration camps and was the prototype for later camps like Auschwitz. Anyone who didn't fit the Nazi ideal could end up here and it will never be known exactly how many people died during the 12 years the camp operated. It's difficult not to be affected by this place. You can barely begin to imagine what it must have been like to be imprisoned here. Two hundred thousand ordinary people forced to live under extraordinary circumstances. Imagine living in these horrendous conditions under the constant threat of death from disease, malnutrition, beatings, shootings and suicide. Walking down this avenue with its leafy trees and peaceful surroundings, it's very difficult to imagine that men and women lived and died here. The emotions you feel as you walk around are very raw. In fact, it's a moving place. And you can't help wondering how anyone could cause this much pain and suffering on the scale of these death camps. I know what you're thinking. God's meant to be a God of love, right? So how can he allow places like purgatory and hell to exist? You won't find any mention of purgatory in the Bible. It's an invention of the medieval church. God has no part of it. Its purpose, so the church said, was to purge one's life before entering heaven. 
However, God tells us He has already done this through Christ. You and I can have the assurance of salvation today. All we have to do is accept Jesus. As part of Hitler's final solution, millions of men, women and children were exterminated across Germany and Poland. Here at Dachau, although the gas chambers were not used on the scale of those at Auschwitz, they were nevertheless a deadly reality. The ovens at Dachau burned day and night and still couldn't keep up with the dead. All this was set up to remove any trace of the people who died here. This crematorium is the final resting place of over 30,000 people. who created it. If I told you that Hitler was a man of love, would you believe me given the evidence? Yet if an eternally burning hell is true, then that's exactly what we're being asked to believe of God. Is a God of love capable of creating something far worse than this? No, he isn't. And with such a distorted picture of God, it's no wonder that many people live in fear of him or simply reject him outright. of hell as a fiery underworld, complete with pitchforks and horned demons, doesn't come from the Bible. So where does it come from? Well, it's snippets of the Bible read out of context, a bit of Greek mythology, the teachings of the medieval church, and a few depictions by artists like Dante and Milton, and we get our picture of hell. I can only begin to imagine what it must be like for God to be so misunderstood, to be the object of horror and terror, to be thought of as worse than Hitler, capable of causing more pain than anyone can ever imagine. In this epic battle being fought between good and evil, Satan, God's enemy, is pleased. What better way to discredit God than to paint him as a vengeful tyrant bent on eternal torture. The sad reality is the only eternal torture will be in the heart of God because only God truly understands the value of a human being, what a life is really worth. And the joy he feels for those who accept him can never fully replace the pain from those he has lost forever.
Bible says that one day in the future, God will break into human history with such force that things will never be the same again. Listen to the promise. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. This is a very different picture of God to the one the idea of hell paints. God is doing everything he can to encourage our decision for him. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants to save all of us, but he won't force us to choose him. And in the end, the choice is ours to make. And that choice is simple. Life or death, God or nothing. For me, the choice is easy.